morning. Um, this is Jody Frick Formiller, and I am the HR Director at William Berenshire, and we are um, welcoming you to our HR and COVID-19 Legislation Part 1 webinar. Uh, before we get started, I do have a few house cleaning items that I'd like to share with you, um, and then I will do some introductions, and we will turn it over to Penny. So, um, first thing we'd like is that all participants are muted upon entry. You can ask a question by clicking in the Q&A button, which appears on the bottom of your screen. Uh, you'll be able to see the other questions that are being asked, and if you see one that interests you, click the upvote icon, which will help us know how many people are interested in that question. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website's COVID-19 resource page within 24 hours, and um, we'll just take it from there. So. What I'd like to do is um, welcome um, Penny Phillips, who is our employment attorney at Boy and Berenshear, and she is with Fellheiber Larson, and she has been there for, she's been practicing for 30 plus years. Um, and then Barb Saudi is a um, business advisory services partner with Boyum. And um, then we have Chris Wittick, who is our tax tiger, and tax partner who will be helping field some of the questions. And again, like I said, I am the HR Director and Firm Administrator at Boyum, and we are um, so thrilled to have Penny with us. And um, she's a wealth of information, and so I am going to turn it over to Penny right now. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm Penny Phillips. I've been practicing at Fell Harbor for almost 30 years. I was in-house counsel for two years and um, I went back to uh, my original law firm. So I've only been practicing in employment law uh, uh, for the last 30 years. I have dressed up for you today. I think all of us had uh, from the waist up, um, which I'll say is one of the first days that I've gotten, um, uh, forced myself to look nice for you all. So I, um, uh, good morning. I'm gonna to talk to you about, um, oh, let's see, Chris, I, I'm not able to control the uh, screen here. I'm going to talk to you, if I can get the slides to work, about um, the new uh, law that was, thank you, uh, was created. Um, just very, very um, recently on March 18th, 2020, that gives um, employees the right to emergency family and medical leave and emergency paid sick leave. This is a very limited law in that it went into effect on April 1st, 2020, and it expires on April, excuse me, December 31st, 2020. Uh, the uh, the basics of the law is that uh, of the laws are to provide paid emergency um, family leave and paid emergency sick leave that are offset 100% by payroll credits to the employer. Uh, and again, the idea here is that if people need to be home either because of a sick, uh, to take care of a child or because they're sick or taking care of somebody who is sick, then uh, the employer will give the employee time away from work without any cost to the employer. And of course, that meets the public policy of trying to make sure that we don't spread um, uh, the coronavirus. Could you advance the slide, Chris? It's just not working here on my end. Um, okay, sorry about that. I'm going to have to keep asking you to do that because I can't get it to work. Who's covered? All private employers with fewer than 500 employees. And I'm going to assume um, that all of you have less than, or, than 500 employees, so I'm not really going to spend any time talking about that. But of course, if you do have larger, if you are a larger employer, uh, we can answer questions. Um, the uh, next slide, please. Um, Small employers with fewer than 50 employers can be exempted from the law, but only if the employer meets and can document one of the following. Providing requested leave 
would result in the business's expenses and financial obligations exceeding available business revenues and cause the small business to cease operating at a minimum minimal capacity. Uh, the employee's absence would entail a substantial risk to the financial health or operating uh, capabilities of the business, or there are not sufficient workers who are able and willing and qualified to perform the services of the business, and those labor or services are needed for the small business to operate at minimal capacity. So you can see it's a pretty, pretty strict test. Um, I haven't talked to anybody yet in the clients that I work with who have uh, um, tried to argue that they would be exempt under this particular provision, but you, just so you know, that provision is available. Uh, there is also a discretionary uh, exemption for healthcare providers and emergency responders. And again, I, I think I'll just not go into detail about that unless people have specific questions, which of course we'll be happy to answer. Uh, the first part of the FFCRA amends the FMLA, the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1992, to give employees up to 12 weeks of FMLA between April 1st and December 31st. Um, the employee has to be on the payroll for the last 30 days, and of course can include people who were laid off and then rehired um, after a period of time. And the, the trick about the EFMLA and what makes it unique in this particular circumstance is that um, uh, normally employers are not subject to the FMLA, the Family and Medical Leave Act, unless they have 50 or more employees. In this particular instance for this particular law, it applies to any employer. So you may not have FMLA obligations under federal law, uh, because you're under 50 employees, but you will have obligations for EFMLA under the new federal law, even if you are under 50 employers, employees, excuse me. Uh, it's uh, the Family and Medical Leave Act um, emergency leave is only available if the employee can't work because the ch their child's school is closed or daycare is unavailable due to COVID related reasons. So that's that. this is a very limited um, uh, leave availability. The employee, if they're eligible, they get 12 weeks of EFMLA, the first 10 days are unpaid, and the remaining leave is up to 10 weeks, is paid at two thirds of the employee's average regular rate, but it's capped at $200 a day per employee or $10,000 in total. And this is where the payroll tax comes in. Uh, it, uh, and again, we can try to answer some questions as, as we go along here. Employers must provide, in addition to the EFMLA, uh, all employees with a new bank of emergency paid sick leave, EPSL, that can be used as a result of absences related to COVID-19. The employees get up to 80 hours of, of bank leave, full-time employees, and that's defined as 40 hours, get 80 hours. Part-time employees get their weekly scheduled hours. Um, and then if there's an employee that you have that has irregular hours, that employee gets the six-month average. Uh, important to start talking about when you can use EPSL because there's been a lot of confusion as a result of the Department of Labor scrambling to get uh, employers information. An employee can use EPSL if they're unable to work and they significantly telework. So you can't be able to work at home either because the employee is subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19. The employees or the employee's been advised uh, by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine because of COVID-19 or the employees experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 is seeking a medical diagnosis, um, or the employee is caring for an individual subject to or advised to quarantine or isolate, uh, or uh, the employee is caring for a son or daughter whose school or place of um, care is closed, and that's the same as the FMLA. And then this last catch-all is employees experiencing similar conditions, and absolutely nobody 
uh, as far as I can tell, has any idea what that means, including the Department of Labor, which always makes me feel a little bit better um, if I can't figure it out and they can't either, then it must really be not clear. So what EPSL uses, quarantine or isolated order, isolation order, excuse me, that includes orders that advise some or all of the citizens to shelter in place. And Minnesota does have a shelter in place. Um, but I wanna walk through the, um, some of the challenges of applying this particular provision. Because an employee is only eligible for EPSL if they are not able to work as a result of the order. Uh, that work or telework. So the fact that an, a, a company, if you could advance the slide, um, has, to, um, has to shut down due to the shelter in place will not alone, will not, well not alone, will not allow an employee to get the EPSL. The key question in every situation is, is the employee able to work but for being required to comply with a quarantine or isolation order. If you could move to the next slide. Um, so I, I, again, I just wanna give some more examples here because I, I think probably this is the most common question I've had since this law came into effect. So, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm unintentionally jumping ahead a few slides here, but uh, Governor Waltz's order shut down restaurants um, and bars, uh, that the employees can't work uh, at those bars or restaurants. But that does not necessarily mean they're entitled to the EPSL because you, um, you have to be unable to work due to um, the order. And in that case, there's no work available. So there's sort of two parts you have to look at. Is there work available and why can't the employee work uh, do the work that is available. <clears throat> and I think there's some more examples of that as we go along. So EPSL um, uses include advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine. So I think I have COVID-19. I call my healthcare provider because they don't want me to come in. The healthcare provider asks me a series of questions, uh, indicates that they think I may have COVID-19, but I'm not going to be tested. If the healthcare provider says, I think you should stay at home, which one of course hopes the healthcare provider does, then that would be a reason uh, to get EPSL. So um, if the other piece of it is if there's work available, even though I might be self-quarantining, I may not be eligible for the EPSL. Uh, so that's the second reason. The third, um, uh, I think I'm losing track of my numbers here, but uh, to care for a, a son or daughter if the school is closed or place of care of, is unavailable. It's the same as the EFMLA. It's only available if the employee needs to and is actually caring for the child. So one of the questions that I kept getting over and over again is, what, what does an employee get EPSL if their spouse is also at home? Um, if there's another suitable adult, no, you can split the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the EPSL pay is paid at the employee's average regular rate over a six month period of time. The regular rate is calculated by the FLSA. Way too boring to talk about in this uh, session. Um, you would all, uh, I think, fall asleep. Uh, <clears throat> EPSL is, again, capped depending on the reasons for the usage. If you're taking it for your own illness or quarantine, it's, a, it's get given at a higher rate of pay, not to exceed 511 per day, 5,000 in the aggregate. <clears throat> if it's taken for another reason to care for somebody else uh, or school is closed, then it's the same as the EFMLA, which is $200 a day, $2,000 in the aggregate. Uh, coordinating EFMLA, uh, for the first two weeks of EFMLA, an employee may elect to use their EPSL. So the first is a, if you recall, I mentioned that at the beginning of the FMLA, EFMLA, it, the first two weeks are unpaid and then 10 weeks are paid. So if the employee chooses, they can use their EPSL, assuming they meet the criteria, um, for the first two weeks of uh, leave, and then it converts to EFMLA paid leave. Uh, 
the employer and employee can agree that the employee can supplement the two thirds wages with existing PTO or other accrued leave, which is a pretty common practice for employers. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so this is, a, I was touching on this earlier, but this slide I hope will explain uh, clearly what the, what, how this um, EPSL works. So employees are not eligible for EPSL or EFMLA if they're laid off or if their employer doesn't have work for them. So again, the idea is that employer has work, employee cannot work for one of the qualified reasons. So the DOL has helped somewhat helpful FAQs, and this is number 26. If your employer furloughs you because you, they don't have enough work or business, you're not entitled to take sick leave or FMLA, you may be eligible for unemployment benefits. And I think that is one of the questions I saw earlier. <clears throat> uh, the same is true if the employee's work site closes. So if because Governor Waltz ordered the closure of certain businesses, that does not entitle employees to emergency paid sick leave because um, there's no work available. And the reason, I mean, the employee may have COVID-19, but there, because there's no work available, there's no access to the EPSL. <clears throat> uh, next, yep, thank you. Intermittent um, EPSL or EFMLA can be agreed to between the employer and the employee. And I've actually had a lot of questions about this. So um, employee has to stay home to help their minor child uh, do the school, do school, uh, uh, but also can telecommute or telework. So she's working four hours in the morning and taking four hours of EFMLA in the afternoon. That is fine as long as the employer agrees. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, re regulations require continuation of group health insurance benefits during EFMLA and EPSL, although there are some <laughs> additional tax credits for a qualified um, health plan expenses. Documentation, you do want to have documentation because the IRS has issued some guidelines. I'll leave it to your um, experts on, um, on discussing those guidelines, but at the very least, you should have the employee's date name, the dates for which the leave is requested, a statement of the reasons why the employee is requesting the leave, and a statement, and I think it's helpful to have a, an actual signature that the employee is unable to work or telework for the reason <clears throat> that, <coughs> excuse me, for the reasons that um, give them the right to take the leave. <clears throat> Here's a link to the uh, poster that's required um, <laughs> to be posted at work where there's probably not a lot of employees, but you can also mail it electronically uh, to your employees if you choose. <clears throat> uh, just briefly, this is sort of a negative in, or, in an already negative uh, world, but there is liability if employers fail to comply with either EFMLA or uh, the emergency paid sick leave. Um, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, just anybody who has business in Minneapolis, don't forget about the emergent, uh, about the sick and safe time. The depart, the Minneapolis Department of Labor has has said that if you are in Minneapolis, sick and safe time can be used when um, there's a closure by a public official or the child's uh, place of care is closed. St. Paul has not um, said anything about that. <clears throat> Excuse me, Nick. Uh, and then just if you're going to reduce people's wages, as which the, you, you will if you are giving them two thirds of their wages, if they take emergency paid leave or EFMLA, don't forget that Minnesota has the wage theft statute that requires employers to notify employees if they're getting time off at, or if they're ha being paid a lower rate we haven't heard anything from the Department of Minnesota Department of Labor about whether or not they're going to enforce this provision at this time. Uh, but I, it, you could certainly send an email to an employee just once they apply for and are granted the leave saying, this will confirm that you um, are going to be paid EPSL at this rate of pay, uh, and that should suffice under Minnesota law.
<clears throat> excuse me, under the Minnesota wage notice. Uh, would now, let's see. Oh, let me give this. Well, we can either take a break now and I can answer questions about, um, or, uh, or we can read some of the questions, or I can just go through these next two pieces before we turn to talking about furloughs. Um, any preference, folks? Yeah, let's let's keep going for now. Um, but for people out there, I know we've we've got eight questions um, in the chat so far. So if you see a question that is similar to your question, if you can, uh, there's a little thumbs up there. If you vote for it, uh, it'll go to the top of the list, and then we'll be more likely to answer that question. But uh, for now, let's let's keep going, and then we'll circle back, and we'll try and get to uh, every single one of the the questions in the chat. Okay, so I would say this is probably the most common question that I've had since this um, pandemic caused us all to go home. And that is, what do I do with an employee who's afraid to come to work because of contracting COVID-19? And um, I'll start with the FFCRA. Um, I mean, the first question, of course, is are they eligible for leave? Um, because they, they may be eligible for some type of leave. However, you'll, you'll notice from what I talked about earlier is that fear alone is not a basis to take the leave. Um, it, the EFMLA doesn't give leave for, um, <clears throat> for somebody who's afraid. The emergency paid sick leave doesn't give um, leave for somebody who's afraid. The Family and Medical Leave Act, if you're more than 50, um, that's a possibility. And then I just added this last piece here, just so people don't forget that even if you're not covered by FMLA, if you have one or more employees in the state of Minnesota, you're covered by the anti-discrimination laws. And under the America with Disabilities Act, if you have 15 or more employees, you're covered by the ADA. And it would be possible that if somebody had severe anxiety about COVID-19, and that's certainly something I've heard about, that they would be uh, potentially entitled to a reasonable accommodation under state or local law. Um, but let's just put all that aside for a minute and just say, what do you do with a person who's afraid to come to work? Um, if they're not eligible for leave, which they likely won't be unless their anxiety rises to the level of a disability, you do have the right to ask them to come to work. And talking to employees about this, I think, is really hard. You need to tell them the safety measures that you're taking care of. Um, I think it's important to keep your employees updated about whether um, there's been any COVID exposure within the work site. And again, you need to do that carefully because you don't want to disclose who has COVID. But if somebody did, you could say, if you're afraid to come to work because you know that there was a COVID exposure, we want to tell you all of the things that we've done to disinfect and clean the work site, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. So um, you can insist an employee come to work. And the only exception would be if the employee has a reasonable belief that they're going to have in, uh, imminent, they're going to be subject to imminent harm, in which case, then they could say, I'm not coming to work. And if you said, come to work, or I'm gonna fire you, you could potentially get into um, uh, a retaliation claim under OSHA or applicable state law. <coughs> Excuse me. This is from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which again, is, is, it, which, um, uh, is the agency that deals with federal law for federal anti-discrimination laws. And they actually, um, issued a, 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 some Q&As on, uh, on COVID-19. <clears throat> this is only going to apply if you have more than uh, 15 employees. <coughs> Excuse me. But one of the questions that I have had is what do you do with somebody who might have a particular vulnerability to COVID-19? Let's say I'm, I'm 70 years old and I have um, lung issues or I have, I have chemotherapy, and that certainly is potentially a reason to take, um, <clears throat> uh, to, to be eligible for the uh, emergency paid sick leave. Uh, but it is also possible if you have more than 50 employees that that is also a, um, a reason to take FMLA. And if you can advance the slide, please. Um, 
but it's also possible that you would be eligible for med unpaid medical or, or two weeks of uh, 80 hours of emergency paid sick leave and then an unpaid leave of absence under uh, either the American with Disabilities Act or the Minnesota Human Rights Act. <clears throat> Another question we keep getting is the pregnant employee receiving a doctor's note advising her not to come to work until after the baby's uh, born. It seems to be a pretty common <coughs> question. Are they eligible for EFMLA leave? No, they don't have a child, unless they also have a child. Uh, are they emergency? Are they el eligible for emergency paid sick leave? Well, if that employee gets a doctor's note that says, I've advised the employee to stay at home, um, <coughs> excuse me, they could be eligible for emergency paid sick leave or they could be eligible for some other kind of leave. Let's see. All right, so now we're done with a crash course, 25 minutes on the um, FFCRA. Uh, keep going or ask questions. Um, yeah, let's, let's keep going and, and we'll circle back to the questions okay. at the end. All right. We're doing a, a, a total switch here in, in terms of topics. I'm um, just talk for a few minutes about uh, furloughs versus layoffs. So common question I've been getting is, what's the difference between a furlough and a layoff? And a furlough, there's no legal definition of either of these terms, really. A furlough, though, suggests that it is a temporary layoff. It's a temporary absence from work. So employer, the restaurant employees, most of them have been furloughed because the goal is to get them to come back to work. A layoff <coughs> or a reduction in force suggests something more permanent uh, than a temporary um, lack of work or temporary inability to work. Uh, well, I always do this, I answer my own question. Are employees eligible for unemployment if I put them on a furlough? Yes. Uh, that that was really goes to the heart of Governor Waltz's order that uh, came out, I believe, on March 16th or 17th, that by shutting down the businesses um, that could uh, contribute to um, the pandemic, I'm not saying they do, I just, you know, that, that having businesses open and not having the social distancing, <clears throat> the governor also changed the unemployment statute that made those employees eligible for unemployment. So a furlough, a layoff, an employee is, I should, shouldn't say is, because ultimately who gets unemployment is up to the department, but it is the intent of the governor's order to make those employees eligible for unemployment. <coughs> Excuse me. Minnesota unemployment, again, crash course, and I'll just tell you right off the bat, I'm not gonna answer too many questions about this, uh, which is the something I get to do after having practiced for 30 years is to is to say I proudly I don't know the answer to that question. But two requirements for eligibility under the Minnesota unemployment: uh, you have to work um, less than 32 hours a week, and the and the employee must receive less in earnings than what they would get for their weekly benefit if they were unemployed. So your weekly benefit is 50% of your average weekly wage that's capped at $740 per week. The length of the, uh, of the benefits is actually longer now than 26 weeks, but under state law, it was 26 weeks. And if eligible to receive <clears throat> unemployment, 50% of any earnings deducted uh, uh, from weekly uh, benefit amount. If you could... Go to the next slide, thank you. So some examples here, employees weekly wages, $1,500 a week, $78,000 a year, um, they're 100% furloughed. Yes, they're eligible, they get 740 a week because they exceed the maximum. And with this new Federal CARES Act, they would also be eligible for $600 a week. Um, so the seven, but the 740 cap would apply. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Weekly wages, $1,500. And this is where it gets tricky. You have a 25% reduction in pay, 40 hours to 30 hours. This is tricky because the employee is not eligible for unemployment because the employee would receive more than the, his or her weekly amount. The weekly benefit is 740. 
at 75% of their normal pay, they would receive $1,125 a week. A 50% reduction in pay is, uh, would mean that they weren't eligible because they're getting over the maximum amount. I hope this is making sense. Final example, 75% reduction in pay, 40 hours to 10 hours per week. Yes, you're eligible. The employee will receive 552 plus the 600 because the weekly benefit is 740. 25% <laughs> of their normal pay, they'd get 375, which is under the amount. 50% of that is 187 um, deducted from the weekly benefit amount, and that's 552.50. I just want to say as a disclaimer that I did not do that math. <clears throat> All right, so what benefits am I required to offer if I place an employee on furlough? Well, many employers are working with their health insurance company to try to get the company to agree to extend benefits during, a, during the furlough. And I haven't heard of one health insurance company that's refused. So if your normal requirement is that you have to work 32 hours a week uh, to be eligible to participate in the health insurance plan and an employee's going to be on furlough, the insurance companies are saying we will waive the 32 hours a week requirement uh, while the employee's on furlough. And I've heard all over the board, some have said till June, some have said uh, I'll, you, I'll only cover the health insurance and other benefits aren't covered, but you can certainly ask that question of your health insurance company if you choose. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, Lay layoffs, furlough, and furlough do's and don'ts. So what I am working with in clients right now is selecting people who are gonna be furloughed. And when you have to pick and choose among um, let's say you've got three people that are doing the same job and you only need one person um, to, to, to do the work. And so you're gonna furlough and or potentially lay off two of the three people. Uh, <clears throat> you need to make sure that you're completely open-minded and not discriminatory in how you choose that, <coughs> excuse me, employee for the furlough or the layoff. It's not the time to say, oh, by the way, I've been meaning to talk to you about your performance or, or really even to not, to pick those people saying it's a performance-based reason um, if you don't have anything to back it up. Uh, don't pick the person who's been complaining about not getting overtime. Don't pick the person who is constantly asking for a religious accommodation. I hope, I hope that uh, makes sense. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, what should you say? We've made the difficult decision to place you on furlough. You are eligible for the following benefits. Uh, <clears throat> we encourage you to apply for unemployment. Here's the link. And <clears throat> Governor Waltz issued an order earlier this week that um, suggests that the Minnesota employers should comply with um, a federal law that requires a notification to employees about how to apply for unemployment benefits. <clears throat> and I can certainly send that to somebody um, uh, at Boyum and you guys can, um, can send it out, but it's available online as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I am not sick. I've got a dry house, <clears throat> just in case you're wondering. Uh, wage and hour issues, uh, I'm going to just spend a couple minutes on here and then uh, turn it over to Jody. Uh, the wage and hour issues are is, an, uh, are, is another law the minute that there's a federal law, the F a Fair Labor Standards Act, Minnesota law, uh, Minnesota Fair Labor Standards Act, <clears throat> that addresses how you pay employees and lots of questions about um, how to pay employees who are continuing to work. So I, I just started here with a quote from the Department of Labor, <clears throat> and I have had this question, which is, we have employees who we don't, we can't afford to pay. Can they volunteer for their to perform work for us? And the short answer to that question is absolutely not. Employees who were previously paid for their work cannot come back and do that work for free. People cannot volunteer in their own job. And I can't think of anything that'll get somebody in more trouble than having that happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, during the, uh, the pandemic, when people do have a reduction in hours, certainly the easiest 
thing to do is to just continue with your hourly non-exempt employees to pay them uh, at whatever their normal salary is or their normal hourly rate is. Um, you could certainly make the argument that you're going to reduce that hourly rate, uh, but under all circumstances, if they work more than 40 hours a week or if you're not subject to federal law, <clears throat> 48 hours a week under the Minnesota Fair Labor Standards Act, you have to pay them overtime. So hourly employees, uh, at least minimum wage and overtime, where, <clears throat> where employers have had a lot of questions of what do I do with the salaried employees? <clears throat> uh, if you could advance the slide, please. So uh, if you'll recall, there are two kinds of employees under the FLSA. There's hourly employees who are subject to overtime, and there are uh, salaried exempt employees who are exempt from overtime. <clears throat> the only classification of employees that are exempt from overtime, I'm oversimplifying here, executive, administrative, professional employees, outside sales, teachers. Uh, so in order to have a, uh, a employee be classified as an exempt salary employee, beginning January 1st, 2020, you, had to pay, you have to pay them at least $684 a week on a salary basis. And a salary is a predetermined amount of compensation, a predetermined amount that constitutes all or part of the employee's compensation. And this is the important part, which is not subject to reduction because of variations in the quality or quantity of the work performed. <clears throat> Uh, an employer has to pay an exempt employee the full and predetermined amount of compensation, free and clear, for any week in which the employee performs any work without regard to the number of hours, days or hours worked. Now, this has got a bunch of exceptions, which I'll try to review briefly. These are just the general rule. So the general rule is you're supposed to give somebody a salary every week, and you can't deduct that if the employer shuts down for a day in the week or there's not enough work. <clears throat> That's the general rule. You can deduct from, you can have, make employees use PTO or vacation or sick leave um, if they're sick for a day or for a half a day, but you do need to pay them that salary for each week in which they perform work. <clears throat> uh, the, all of those rules though, if you could advance the slide, please, um, are subject to the general rule that you do not have to pay an exempt employee any salary for any week in which they perform no work. So what I've had a lot of questions about is I have some salaried exempt employees, your VP, your office manager, we need to reduce their pay, but we wanna keep them working, what should we do? Well, you can do a week of pay if for a week of work, and then one full week unpaid, and then another week of pay, and another week of no pay. <clears throat> so that's what a lot of employers are doing. Two weeks, or one week on, one week off, one week on, one week off. That is one way to deal with continuing to pay somebody and, uh, um, and um, also reducing how much time they're working. <clears throat> there are a couple of other op uh, options. You can certainly reduce the pay um, of a salaried exempt employee to keep their hours the same. So you say, and this is a lot of employers are doing this, we're doing a 10% pay cut. Um, you could do that for your salaried exempt employees. You won't jeopardize the exemption. You just have to remember that they have to get that 684 a week. If they don't get that 684 a week, they're not going to be salaried exempt. <clears throat> You could also convert um, salaried exempt employees to hourly employees for a short term. That's, a, that's another thing you can do. And then you could also do voluntary reductions in hours. So a lot of employers are doing this. I'm gonna pay you uh, $800 a week when I normally pay you a $1,000 a week and we're gonna reduce your hours, but you have to, by taking a full day off at a time without pay. So I'm gonna normally work five days a week. I'm only gonna work four days a week. That fifth day is unpaid. If the employee volunteers to do that, that's another way to reduce their pay. <clears throat> and then finally, um, this prospective reductions. And I, I just would urge you to be very careful how you do this because this can be kind of tricky. An employer is not prohibited from prospectively reducing a salary of an employee 
It has to be bona fide uh, and it can't be related to the quality or quantity of the work performed. So you could say, looking in the future, I'm going to reduce your pay. And it's sort of a combination of um, work as many hours as you want um, and we're gonna reduce your salary. Um, uh, but it's gotta be done in the future. You can't do it in the week in which the employee is working. And it's gotta be done not for the, per that which the DOL will decide, not for the purposes of evading the salary requirements. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that might be the last of my slides, is it? Oh, yes, good. That was way too much talking, people. I, I, I typically like to take questions as I go along. Thanks, Penny. This is Jody. Uh, we do have 22 questions, so I'd like to, um, what I will do is I'll read them off and see if Barb may want to chime in as well on some of these. Um, how do we get reimbursed for wages paid and the prospective taxes? Also, do we get tax relief on the employer paid health and welfare benefits? That might be something for you, Chris. Barb. So, Penny, um, well, so the, the reimbursement comes through the uh, payroll tax form, so through the 941. If you feel that your credits are going to exceed what your deposits are, there is a form 7200 that you can complete where you can get basically an advance credit and then it's settled up at the end of the quarter when the 941 uh, gets filed. I, on the health insurance, I think one of your slides, Penny, referred to that maybe being um, being something that that it might be eligible I'm I maybe you could clarify that because I'm not as sure on that point um, I, I actually can't speak too much about the tax credit piece um, <clears throat> and I think we're, one of us is going to have to get back to the um, to the yes. person that asked the question yeah on the health insurance side we'll have to get back to you on that because uh, it's and that that I'll have to search, but it is through your quarterly payroll or potentially an advance credit. All right. Thank so you. the next question up here, I can I can probably take. So it it gets into the PPP loan application, which um, so the question is, if there's a reduction in the workload or the workforce, does it make sense to tap into the PPP loan? before having employees apply for unemployment. Um, so the PPP loans are, are extremely complex and especially planning for when is the right time to make that application. Um, so I do think that planning out your cash flow, looking at the ability of employees to work and do productive work, as opposed to paying them um, full salary when they're really not being productive. Um, that's, that's part of the consideration of the PPP loans. And you wanna be very careful when you apply for those loans. Just last night, we got some new information about how those PPP loans and the timing of them would work. And so once you get approved, you're gonna have up to 10 days uh, but a maximum of 10 days before that PPP money is going to be um, issued to you. And that's when uh, your sort of payroll is going to start again. So on the one hand, the unemployment does not, is not directly impacted by the PPP loan, but the PPP loan should be done in conjunction with how much you're going to be paying people. So if your business is closed right now and everyone's furloughed, I think that's that's probably a good option. And then when you get the PPP money, that's when you're looking at maybe hiring those people back, at which point they would come off of unemployment and then potentially come back in to the workforce. But I'd be very careful about the timing of that, especially if your business is closed and paying those employees isn't going to generate any revenue for the business. Um, but we've also uh, done a, a, a full separate webinar that ended up being two hours. Uh, it's posted on our website. And it was more of a deep dive into that PPP. Um, that's a big, big topic right now, I know. 
and we'll probably have more uh, information on that coming up soon. Um, but definitely can consider that in conjunction with some of these, these payroll issues. So the next uh, question on my list here uh, that I've got is, if you're doing the paid sick leave, so if employees are getting that paid sick leave, um, this is probably for Barb, are those wages exempt from the FICA, either on the employee side or the employer side? So if you're doing the paid sick leave, is that stuff exempt from all the payroll taxes? It is not exempt from the employee uh, for, for payroll taxes, and I don't believe that it's exempt for the employer either. Okay. Um, so a question for maybe even for Jody here, we've got can an employee, uh, can we require employees to use their existing PTO or can they save their existing PTO and give them one of the other leaves sort of before or instead of using their PTO? You want me to answer that, Jody? Sure. I just couldn't, I couldn't get unmuted. Sorry about that. Oh, it's okay. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, feel free. I, I'm sure you'll have a more in-depth answer. Well, for if an employee is gone for reasons that are covered by the new uh, federal emergency sick leave, then you, you have to give them that leave for those reasons. Um, but do I they have to use their PTO? Yeah, I don't know. Well, Correct. afterwards, if they can't come back, they could use their PTO and you could let them use their PTO if they didn't want to use the emergency FMLA, use the emergency sick leave for the emergency FMLA. But again, the whole point of that paid sick leave, emergency paid sick leave is to give a new bank of time to employees to use if they're gone for work for COVID related reasons. Okay, so that ties into another question that we have. Is a letter from a hospital's OCMED department sufficient documentation for the EPSL or do we have to have a licensed provider? I, I, the, the rules are really flexible about right. what, what kind of note you're supposed to get. And in fact, I, what I was struggling wrestling with yesterday was the Minnesota Department of Health says you can't ask for it or don't ask for a doctor's note uh, to support um, somebody being gone from work. So I think a note from an occupational health provider, which is a is a healthcare provider as defined by the FMLA would be fine as long as it met the criteria for um, what you generally want to have um, uh, to support the need for the leave or the, for the payment rather. Yep, thank you. We had several questions about um, unemployment, uh, whether if somebody has a reduction, which you touched on this, but um, another question that tied in with this was that if somebody works a week and doesn't work a week, works a week and doesn't work a week, are they eligible for the unemployment on that week off? Uh, it is my, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this in a way that makes everybody hate lawyers, but it is my understanding that the week that they are off they should be eligible. But the Department of Economic Security, I think is struggling and um, uh, just even interpreting all of these new rules. So I would certainly say, if an employee asks you that, it is my understanding, your, you, it is your understanding that that's the case, um, but ultimately it's the, the department's decision. All right, so here's another one. To clarify, the EFMLA is only for those um, who do not have childcare. For frame of reference, we are a childcare center who is still open and are providing care for our staff's children as well. We have two employees out for legitimate medical reasons. So would they only qualify for e EPSL? Well, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, it, they're not eligible for e, uh, FMLA because they're out for medical reasons. They may or may not be eligible for emergency paid sick leave depending on the reasons that um, they're out. If they're out for COVID related reasons, they either have symptoms or they've been diagnosed and you have the appropriate documentation, then they are eligible for the 
for the um, EPSL. If it's something else, then they're just eligible for medical leave. Okay, thank you. You got to kind of sort through this way. I had the slide about all the different, you know, if it's not this, it could be this. And if it's not this, it may be something else. You have to sort of exhaust all the possible, <clears throat> the possible reasons. So, um, Barb, we get, we got some questions here about unemployment. Um, and I think we, I think we've touched on some of these, but let's just um, confirm for people these right in a row. So owners of an S corp, can they apply for unemployment if they're unable to pay themselves a full wage? So I have been telling uh, them to apply. The, the unemployment office has not addressed the S corp owner. They, they talk about the self-employed and the sole proprietors being eligible now under the federal expansion. You know, Minnesota has, has, has uh, told S corp owners that, uh, you know, that you're not, eligible unless you specifically opt in. So there's been no guidance that's been issued on that. Uh, we, I have had people apply and get rejected. So at, at this point, it's still an unknown until I think they're probably waiting for their guidance as well. And, and if they do get it, it would, my, I would believe it would only be the $600 weekly benefit that the federal government has expanded coverage. Okay, so similar to that, are small business owners eligible to ap apply for the unemployment if there's a significant reduction in work? And how does their own, um, I mean, I think some of that depends on how you define small business owner. That could be a Schedule C, um, it could be a small partnership or a single member LLC. So are they eligible for unemployment? And then how does the PPP loan interact with that? Well, if you take out a PPP loan, and that is intended to cover wages, so it would it wouldn't it would be like double dipping to then apply for unemployment benefits, be collecting unemployment and paying yourself a salary with proceeds from the PPP loan. So I think you that that's pretty clear that you you wouldn't be doing both. Where there's I think confusion or or un, where I'm not clear on either is for those S corp owners or the self-employed and they've got some income coming in you know anybody who's an employee who's laid off has to report any income that they receive while they're collecting benefits so if you're collecting more than your uh, required or your mandatory expenses like maybe rent and utilities and some of those how will that impact the benefits I would imagine that the that some of this may be things that are that are worked out and the department will come back later to try to uh, get and ask for some documentation on that or if people are collecting benefits and I'd be very careful about if you've got income coming in uh, and it, that exceeds required a minimal expenses uh, collecting unemployment and not paying a salary because there is a requirement for owners to pay themselves a reasonable salary before distributions. So that's where you can really get into trouble is if you're paying yourself a distribution and not a salary and being on unemployment. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would, I would add to that, um, that's really looking at the S-Corp side of it. If you were a Schedule C, I think there's still significant uncertainty as to how these PPP loans are going to interact with some of the employment or the unemployment benefits. Um, and just generally, there's a lot of uncertainty around Schedule C owners and how the PPP loan is supposed to work. So those applications for those strictly self-employed like Schedule C folks, um, that application opens on Friday. And we've really yet to see guidance on how that's supposed to work. So um, I would say, stay tuned for the Schedule C folks, um, because the answer is, is probably gonna be different than Barb's answer, which is, which is great for the S-Corp owners. Um, one other question on the unemployment here, um, are employees with the reduced workloads eligible for unemployment, even though they've not been laid off or furloughed? I think Penny covered that where if it's they have if they're reduced below 32 hours a week then they are eligible but you have to look at the at whether they will actually receive benefits if they're earning more than what their weekly benefit amount 
would be on unemployment and there would be a reduction in their benefit uh, for 50% of, of their earnings yeah. based on those. So take another look at those at that example you know, walks it through, I think, really well. So here's a, here's a math question for you, Barb. Um, so in the, in the example of the maximum unemployment, so you're getting 740 from Minnesota, and then you're getting an additional 600, uh, you in this example being the employee, you're collecting 1340 per week in unemployment. Is that right? Correct. And so is there any stipulation stopping people from being paid more on unemployment or no um, <laughs> and they realize that some people at the lower income levels may be making more on unemployment than they are when they are working and have accepted that that's just one of the byproducts but they're mostly concerned because of the average compensation across the country and that's where the 600 was was determined it looks like is that the average unemployment comp across the country is 350 the average comp is around a thousand a week that 600 is trying to get them to to what they were making prior to uh, the pandemic. So um, here's a here's a tax question that that I'll I'll handle sort of about the PPP loans. Oh. So if you uh, if you've got the FMLA or the the sick wages um, and the payroll tax credits for that, do they need to be excluded from payroll to be eligible for the PPP loan forgiveness? Um, it sort of works uh, the opposite way uh, that, that that question is asked. I would say, if you get a PPP loan, you are not eligible for the payroll tax credits. And there's also a payroll tax deferral um, that's out there. So it's, it's more of a, if you choose to do the PPP, you become ineligible for those credits. And there's really nothing you can do um, to get both, you just automatically become ineligible uh, for the payroll tax credits. But that's that's a good question. Um, next question, um, let's go to if an employee, um, so this is probably for Penny. Um, if an employee uses the paid sick leave for the first two weeks of the FMLA leave, so they can still receive their pay, are they only getting two thirds of their regular pay or are they getting their full pay? They're getting uh, two thirds of their pay. If you recall, you get your full pay. I'm gonna oversimplify. You, your full pay if you're sick, you'll get two thirds of your pay if, if you're taking care of somebody else, including FMLA, EFMLA. So the first two weeks of the EFMLA, if you elect to use it, are paid at two thirds and then the second 10 weeks or the 10 weeks are also paid at two thirds. Okay. And then if you were capped at the $200 per day for the FMLA, can the employer pay the balance of an employer's, an employee's wages as regular pay? So if they're otherwise capped at the 200, um, could the employer pay them extra, pay them back up to their full wage? Yes. And you can also allow employees well, I guess I should say yes from a from an employment point of view. I, I mean, I don't know. You won't get the payroll credit, the tax, payroll tax credit. You can also let an employee use uh, a portion of their PTO to make to make them up to a hundred percent. Yeah, the the tax credit is going to be capped at those those at rates. Um, but certainly, yeah, I think you can pay them more if you want. Um, so let's go, um, let's go to a question maybe, uh, for Barb here. Um, how, what happens if you're operating under an LLC, let's say it's a schedule C and you have no history of paying a salary because you have not paid yourself, uh, an official wage because you've just been a, a schedule C business. Yeah, so when you're applying for unemployment, that falls under the federal expansion for sole proprietors and self-employed if you're a Schedule C. So you want to make sure that you follow the, uh, they have a, a very well written, I think, uh, instruction for people who are, are self-employed for applying for unemployment. 
and then you could put in there what your what your compensation was. So you'd use your net income from your Schedule C as your as your salary. And you could be they have options for hourly, monthly, as far as how you record that. Okay, um, great. So we've we got a question here about commissions. Um, so if if you furlough employees, what's the deal with commissions? Do you still are you still required to pay those um, because they're considered employees, or once you sort of furlough them, does all pay uh, not only the salary but also the commissions? Does that also uh, cut off? I, I would be very careful about um, not paying a, a commission sales employee their earned but unpaid commission if they're on furlough. That's um, one of those um, practices that the Minnesota courts have looked on very um, uh, seriously as being problematic. So I think that if you would, I would, even if the employee is on furlough and no, no longer actively employed receiving um, hourly or salary from the employer, if you can true up what those commissions are, I would make every effort to make that payment. Um, so a question here from uh, an old friend, Sarah Dickerson, uh, just to confirm, it is not required that the employer have a doctor's note for the individual to qualify for the paid sick leave or the FMLA. Are employers allowed to ask for the doctor's note? Well, uh, so I, that's a good question, Sarah. I think we've got some conflicting information about that. The federal law, suggests that you could ask for a doctor's note or other documentation short of a doctor's note for the emergency paid sick leave. I mean, certainly when the employee needs to take it for themselves or others, um, uh, you can ask for some kind of documentation. And, and the federal law also says that you can ask for some type of documentation to support that the employee needs to be home with their child so they're eligible for EFMLA or the um, paid sick leave portions of, um, uh, of uh, to be home with the child. The, the problem is that the Minnesota Department of Health has put on their website that employers shouldn't ask for doctor's notes, which I think is conflicting with federal law. Now, if there's a choice between who wins between the feds and the state, um, sometimes the answer, usually the answer is whatever is most favorable to the employee. I'm not sure what I would say in this particular situation. I would try to get substantiation from your employee that they consulted with the provider and the provider made the recommendation um, for them to stay home or quarantine because of COVID-19 reasons. If you do that, it's not a doctor's note, It'll satisfy the documentation required by, I think, generally the IRS and by the Department of Labor. But I'm not going to say you can't ask for a doctor's note, and I'm not going to say you can ask for a doctor's note because I think it's not clear. And I would like to add to that, it, whatever the employer decides, whether they get a note or not, that they need to be consistent with all employees on that versus picking and choosing who they can get a note from. So along the same, a similar line, so if, if somebody is a critical manufacturer, they are open, they are operating, those, if I'm correct, those are the employees that might be eligible for the paid sick leave and the FMLA, because the business is open, they're operating, they have work to do, right? Those are the ones that, yep. that would Precisely. individually qualify? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, if we have fired an employee during this time and they file for unemployment, are we still able to fight it or do they automatically get it given the current uh, situation? That's a great question. I, I think that I would, um, I mean, you, you are getting paperwork from the Department of Economic Security as your employees apply. And I would 
follow your normal process um, in the, assuming you do get that paperwork of challenging their eligibility because they were terminated for reasons constituting misconduct as defined by the Department of Economic Security. Okay, um, so we got a, I know we got a question beforehand and, and I see one here now about nannies. Um, so if a family has a nanny, uh, a household employee, and the family is now able to care for the child, um, perhaps on their own, can you furlough the nanny? And can the nanny apply for unemployment? Uh, I've actually had that question a couple of times. If the nanny is your employee, subject to W-2, right, she can apply, he, sorry, can apply for unemployment. Jody, you're nodding your head. I'm, yeah, I'm in agreement. Um, yes, I, I would agree and I would add um, somewhat unrelated perhaps, but uh, household employees um, that get W-2s like the nannies, uh, they are not eligible. You're not eligible to get a PPP loan based on them because I, I know I had some other folks ask that before. Can I get a PPP loan to continue paying my nanny? Uh, the answer to that would be no. Um, all right, well, w I think we're, we're doing pretty good on the questions here. Um, if we have an employee um, that's not coming back to work because they live with um, a, an immune compromised individual, whether it's their spouse or a, a relative, um, are they gonna be eligible for the paid sick leave or the FMLA because they're caring for their spouse who maybe isn't sick, but they're immune compromised and at a much higher risk? That's a good question. It makes my head hurt a little bit. Um, but this is, um, I, I don't know why I, kind of, I love questions like this. So you got to sort through all the different laws. I mean, they're not eligible for the EFMLA because they're not home to care for a child. They might be eligible if you have 50 or more employees um, for regular Family and Medical Leave Act because they are needed to stay home to care for uh, a spouse, someone covered by the FMLA, who has um, a serious health condition that makes that person um, um, vulnerable. There is also a very uh, good possibility that with appropriate documentation, that employee who needs to stay home to care for somebody who's particularly vulnerable and um, could get the emergency paid sick leave, but I would want to double check that particular answer before I gave it definitively. Um, all right, there are a couple about PPP, um, which maybe I'll, I'll take. If you receive the PPP, you are not eligible for the tax credits under paid sick leave and FMLA. That is correct. If that is the case, um, the employer would not need to document why they are out under the paid sick leave uh, correct. Um, so the documentation, I think, is important um, just to show that you're complying with the rules. You're not going to get the tax credit, but there still can be a requirement um, for the paid sick leave because it's, it's an add-on to FMLA. Um, so you're not going to necessarily get a tax credit if you're doing the PPP, um, but I, I still think and I assume, Penny, you would agree that documenting all of these things is good, regardless if you're going to get the tax credit on the back end, because the documentation is not really for the purposes of the tax credit. It's just to make sure that the business is doing everything the right way. Um, one other one here about the PPP. If you or your employees collect unemployment more than 25%, um, then you will not have the PPP loan forgiven. Doesn't that mean you can't do unemployment? Um, no, it, it doesn't. Um, whether or not an employee is on unemployment 
does not directly influence the PPP loan forgiveness. However, um, PPP loans are intended for you to be paying the full salary to your employees. So if you are doing that, then the employee just uh, will not be eligible for unemployment. Uh, but in the meantime, they could be. So you could certainly have situations where people are on unemployment for uh, a month and then you get a PPP loan, let's say in May, then you hire them back. And at that point, you're paying them their full salary. They'll no longer be eligible for the unemployment at that point. Um, I would also say that uh, the PPP and the loan forgiveness is, is very, very complicated. There are four factors. They all work together. Um, and that's a, whole, that's a whole separate webinar. So uh, I, guess, I guess we'll just leave it at that uh, for, for now. Um, if you've been applied for the PPP program, but the loan has not been approved yet, can you still use the tax credit until you get your PPP? Um, generally, no. Uh, these tax credits are going to be second quarter because they get um, sort of calculated with the second quarter payroll tax filings. And by then, you will have uh, applied for and received your PPP loan. So as soon as you get that PPP loan, uh, your eligibility for the credits goes away. And really, those credits would have been claimed in your second quarter payroll filing. So um, it, it will have all been sorted out by then. Chris, are, um, there are a couple of questions about religious organizations that um, we've been advised that parishes within the archdiocese are considered an integrated employer and that this law does not apply to us. Does this mean we are not eligible for the tax credit if we provide this leave to our employees? I'm guessing you want me to answer that question? Yes. Uh, I'm a little reluctant to say too much about that because I think it's my partners who might have participated in um, uh, some, uh, some of that um, advice. I, I remember that if you're over 500 employees for 499, you um, don't have to comply with the law. It is my understanding, and, I, and per perhaps um, Chris or Barb can respond, that if you're not required to comply with the law, yet you do anyways, you're going to comply without getting the benefit of the tax credit. Okay, so let's move on to, um, as a church, we, did not, we do not participate in the state unemployment pool. We are unable to get through to the state office to seek guidance on our furloughed staff because of COVID. Is the state opening the pool, oops, um, to us religious, that, are in the, that is the religion? If they deny state unemployment, will the staff still be eligible for the federal 600? All right, so let me just make sure I understand. Um, are you a direct reimburser so that you, um, if you have it, or are you actually exempt from coverage? So lots of nonprofits, we had a lot of questions about this right at the beginning, um, are direct reimbursers, so they don't pay anything out until um, uh, a claim is made. And um, it's my understanding that for those employers, you will receive a 50% credit for um, on your quarterly tax and your quarterly unemployment tax bill, and that those employers will also be eligible to get the $600, or those employees get the $600 additional compensation. Chris, Barb, I don't know if you have any additional imp um, information on that. I, I want to make sure I'm understanding the question. I do know that the federal had expanded for some of those situations, but you know, there again, I think that the state is still trying to figure out exactly how they're going to be managing that aspect of, of the expansion. Yeah, I'm trying to find my notes because most of our clients, most of the clients that I work with are nonprofits and are direct reimburser. 
So that was a big issue because the governor, Governor Waltz's orders did not address that. So everybody was trying to sort it out. I've got notes here, but I'm gonna end up rustling papers and sounding like very irritating. So perhaps we can follow up on that uh, at a later time. And then maybe we should move on. We did have a, a couple areas, that, additional things that we wanted to uh, actually present uh, with Jody and then maybe circle back for some of these final questions. Thanks, Barb. Uh, Penny did cover most of what I was going to cover as far as um, benefits that a lot of the um, healthcare providers are working with their clients to um, see what they can do, either extend grace periods. Um, as long as the premiums are paid on a um, regular basis, they're willing to work with, with, um, with uh, different companies. So it's just a matter of talking with your broker or your agent, um, knowing your plan document um, so that you can see what, what options are there for you. Um, as Penny alluded to earlier that um, some are saying that they'll be, let people that um, are staff that are not working the 32 hours till um, May 31st or end of summer, they'll let them um, stay covered if they're under that, that, that amount. So, um, but Penny basically covered what I was gonna go over. So um, I think we can go on to the last few questions unless there's anything else that you'd wanna add to that, Penny? No, I'm sorry, I took away your ability to talk. No, everybody <laughs> will thank you, truly. <laughs> so um, let's see. Uh, for reimbursing nonprofit employers, if an employee qualifies for unemployment, are we responsible for paying dollar for dollar for the UI costs? If so, are we also responsible for the additional $600 per week? You want to take that, Penny? Um, no, I mean, again, I, I'm sorry. I was just trying to find my notes on that and answering the, the unemployment question for um, direct reimbursers. You'll get reimbursed, is my understanding and, uh, um, that you, um, if you're a direct reimburser, they, the unemployment pays out the, the, the worker, uh, unemployment comp, the department does, and then they bill you on a quarterly basis. And, um, and I, it's, I understood that there was going to be a 50% credit to direct reimbursers for whatever the Department of Economic Security pays out on your behalf that would otherwise be chargeable to your account. The $600 is coming from the federal government, not the state. And I, I don't know for sure, but I do not believe that the $600 gets charged back to the employer, but I, I, I don't wanna speculate because I do not know for 100%. Uh, Barb, Chris, Jody, do you guys know the answer to that? I don't. My that. understanding is that that is a federal and does not <clears throat> impact impact the employer in any way. Thanks, Barb. Well, I think with that, we have taken enough of your time. I want to thank Chris, Barb, and Penny so much for their time on this. Um, this will be available um, on our website, on our COVID-19 website within 24 hours. It will be, it's been recorded. So we wanna thank everyone for their questions. Um, our emails are um, on the slide, as you can see from um, what's up on the screen right now. Um, I do wanna say that um, as far as Penny goes, emailing Penny questions, um, I would prefer that our clients email me first and then if we need to seek legal counsel, we'll let Penny know, but um, that would be the best for our clients at this point. Is that okay with you, Penny? Absolutely. Okay, all right. So thank you again, everyone, for your time, and we hope that you have a great day. Thank you, everybody.